everyone, Alexa Dunn here. And today I am going to be having a conversation with the YA and middle grade author, JL. We're going to talk about her experiences navigating the publishing industry as a black author. JL is the author of the forthcoming YA fantasy duology, Wings of Ebony from Simon and & Schuster and the middle grade fantasy series, Park Row Magic Academy from Bloomsbury. I really wanted to bring this topic and this discussion to my viewers. Many of you have asked for more resources as Black writers, but it didn't feel right coming from me. Uh, I, I think it's far better to kind of talk to authors, an author like JL who has had personal experiences and has amazing advice to give. You are an incredible person and my friend, and I know how much mentoring that you do and how much you care about helping other writers and so i'm just grateful to you for you know talking to me about this topic and sharing your amazing insights uh with my viewers so just to start i would love it if you would tell everyone a little bit about your debut YA novel and a little bit about your middle grade series which i'm so excited for Sure. So my YA debut is Wings of Ebony, which is out with Simon and Schuster February 9th. And um, that one is about a black teen from an inner city neighborhood who uh, finds racist gods poisoning her neighborhood community with violence, drugs and crime. And so she has to lean into her, her demigoddess heritage to tap into her powers and fully realize her potential. Um, to eradicate them and protect her community. And then my middle grade <laughs> is a lot lighter. <laughs> it's a, an inner city magic school um, that takes place um, in the real world. So it's very much contemporary fantasy. Um, and I just never had anything like that growing up. You know, I only had sort of European centered magic. So I wanted to create something that was inner city where I grew up. And the main character is a is a, um, a black girl named Kiana, and it's really fun. There's lots of really whimsical, quirky hilarity in that one, and tons of black joy, and just, um, it's a lot of fun. That one's um, still an edit, so there's not much I can say about it, but it's a lot of fun, lots of laughing. And can you talk a little bit about your kind of publishing journey? Um, what queering was like for you, uh, your YA debut, what book that was for you, first book, second book, et cetera? So for me, writing was something that was it was fun, but it wasn't something that I considered I could do professionally um, until about the summer of 2018. Um, and so I wrote a manuscript, um, entered it in Pitch Wars, hoping I would get in. Um, and then you have to wait like six weeks to hear if you get in. So I wrote another book, um, my second book, uh, while I was waiting. And that book just sort of took over my life. <laughs> that was Wings of Ebony. I did not get into Pitch Wars, which worked out because uh, shortly after it was announced that I didn't get in, the week, uh, the next week was uh, Div Pit on Twitter. And I entered Wings of Ebony and Div Pit and the pitch blew up. I got so many requests from editors. Um, it was just a wild ride. And I started querying. I ended up with um, multiple offers for agent representation. I signed with Natalie Lacostal at Bradford and we uh, revised, we went on sub and um, Wings of Ebony sold. So to Simon and Schuster, super excited. Well, I'd actually, I'd love to talk more about that specifically. I mean, cause I know you and I know that you have great advice. For, for querying and kind of navigating that part of the industry pitch contests. But specifically in this time, especially, I've, I've gotten so many questions of, I mean, we've seen what has been happening where there are agents who are, it's like a whole new level of shady. <laughs> and I, I think it's important for black authors to protect themselves in the industry. And I would love for you to talk a bit about you know, how to figure out who do you query uh, with these new opportunities with editors opening up their inbox? Is there any specific advice you have for kind of how authors can kind of navigate those situations and essentially protect themselves from being taken advantage of? Yeah, no, that's a great question um, and incredibly relevant and timely. Um, 
So, I mean, first and foremost, anytime a writer is going to query an agent, do your research. Mm -hmm. um, specifically look at the agency, uh, look at the books and authors that they represent, mm -hmm. look at um, their sales record. Um, chances are, you know, somebody with a publisher's marketplace subscription. So just ask around, um, but really try to find agents who have an idea of what they're doing. New agents can be fantastic advocates because they're super hungry and um, don't don't necessarily be turned off by an agent just because they're new. Um, I would look more at if that agent is being mentored by someone. I would look at the agency. I would look at the agency's reputation, the the, the book slash authors that they work with, and put to put together a very informed query list. Once you have your query list together, start sending out your queries in batches. Um, right now there's an elevated interest and i i hate that i have to use that word um but it's just the truth so there is an elevated interest in stories from black writers and that is fantastic the access that i've seen being given right now is unprecedented um however that doesn't mean that everyone has the same intentions so <laughs> you you need to guard yourself you need to you know, when doors open and you, you can take advantage of opportunities, I'm not saying like, don't, I'm just saying be really prudent, do your research and understand that as a writer entering the query trenches is terrifying. Like you're, for me, at least I was hoping someone would give me a chance. Someone would read my query and just, you know, by some, you know, luck, <laughs> like some of it and be willing to read of it. You, you, it takes a while for you to realize that like you have the asset. Like the agent needs you to work with them. So there's this odd power dynamic between the querying writer and the agent. Um, and what I would, would, would remind all writers, but especially black writers and especially right now is understand that your story is very important, whether an agent values it or not. Um, and your story is, is, is important, it's an asset and it deserves to be protected and represented uh, well. And so um, don't allow that sort of, you know, desperation that someone would take you on to allow yourself to be taken advantage of. Um, there are fantastic advocates out there and there are some not so great ones. There are well-meaning not so great ones and they're intentionally, intentionally not people I wouldn't recommend. But you, you see a lot happening and the best thing that you can do is you can make a great list informed by research and then before you actually take an offer, take a phone call with someone who expresses interest, connect with someone else and ask questions. Mm -hmm. You can DM me anytime. I think most people <laughs> that are that are that are mutuals on Twitter or follow me on Twitter know that I'm pretty open with my DMs from writers. If you have questions about querying and such, like I'm happy to chat with you, um, but you should ask questions. I would never suggest if you, for example, take an editor up on a open inbox policy if they express interest in your manuscript i would not suggest then hopping on a call with them or talking numbers with them it's fantastic if they express interest but then you need to take a step back and say thank you let me find representation and i will be in touch so don't let your excitement lead to haste um, because you want to make sure you're you're making you're making the right choice for multiple reasons like having an agent is very very helpful if they're a good agent and a good advocate they help negotiate your contract terms. They help get you more money for your project. Um, they can answer a ton of questions. They also help you if they're an editorial agent, they help you get your work in its best possible shape. My agent was very editorial and it was very helpful working with her because she helped me better prepare my manuscript before going on sub. And not all agents are that way, but a lot of it is figuring out what kind of re agent relationship you need and you would benefit most from. Um, it's a very personal relationship. And that's something that I didn't understand um, before I entered the industry. This is someone you work very closely with. Um, you talk to them often or in theory, and it's important that you guys have good communication. Um, it's important that you, that you feel seen and heard. Um, it's important that you don't feel exploited, if I can just be blunt. Um, it's important that you don't feel like an agent or an editor is collecting you um and i i have to say that these yeah. things happen it's like oh black writers are hot let's collect we've them. seen it we've we we've tried to, to help people still steer clear of it so it's and it's 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 hard right because 
in that in that space you're just so happy to have the interest you know so I it's get a it. come true get it. Yeah. right no it really is it is something you've worked very hard for so mm -hmm. i get it but i would caution you in that in that moment of excitement to sort of lean into your community um black writers even if you don't know any other black writers i mean well now you do because you know me because you've watched this so you can now dm me but reach out to someone to get someone who's been in the industry a little bit um to get answers the the black community of writers that i've met are very very close-knit so we really ride for each other <laughs> like we we um are constantly sharing um information um we're very open with each other because yeah. we're very much a minority in this industry and we believe in you know linking arms and pulling each other up that's just sort yeah. of how we roll well, and, and people ask about the Whisper Net Network all the time, and it, it has whispers for a reason, but I know particularly for the Black community publishing, it's critical to have that Whisper Network functioning because you have to protect each other. Absolutely. I mean, when something happens, sometimes you have a gut feeling, right? You're like, did I misread that? Was that low-key shady? No, it just must be me. And I've been in the position, I mean, obviously not with my agent. Natalie is a dream come true. I'd say query her, but she's close to unsolicited query. So um, <laughs> you can at least follow her on Twitter and maybe she'll open up eventually. But I say, what I like to say is that don't assume you're overreacting or you misinterpreted. Just mm -hmm. get a second opinion. Because, you know, too often, like we as black writers take the fault on ourselves. Like, oh, they didn't mean it that way. Or, mm -hmm. oh, that wasn't shady, I'm being sensitive. It's like, well, I mean, I think a lot of what we're seeing right now in the world is that no, a lot of those low key shady things were shady. Um, and so I think it's important that you understand you're not alone in the industry. And that seemingly one chance or one shot or one person who's giving you the time of day is not the end all be all. Yeah. So just um, be very, very guarded. Um, definitely take advantage of these unprecedented opportunities we're seeing but be smart with every step of the way and connect with other writers so that you're not um, blindly making decisions. And don't assume that you're misreading things or being too sensitive, or if you feel a certain kind of way. I remember when I was querying, one of my mentors told me, if you have a weird feeling in your gut about something, lean into that, explore that, ask questions around that, don't dismiss that. Yeah. So um, just be very, very careful. Um, and it's been exciting too. There's lots of positive stuff happening I've seen. Um, I have so many friends have been querying since I've been querying and goodness, like a huge group of them are signing with agents left and right, which is fantastic. The way these bookshelves are gonna look in the next few years, like it's just mind blowing. It's so awesome. Um, so there is good stuff happening. Just be careful. I'm very, very protective of my community. Be careful. Well, and are there any specific uh, things to be aware of uh, for Black writers specifically with, we'll say, I mean, there are agent red flags, but this can happen at an editorial level as well when you're getting to the selling your book stage as well. Um, but also uh, things that a Black writer shouldn't be afraid to ask an agent, maybe on a call or an editor on a call, if this is about selling a book. Well, and you know, so there's going to be different opinions on this. I'll say that. Like, I'm obviously just one person, but I've always been told you want your agent to be able to sell you book, your book. You want your editor to be able to get your book because your editor is who really works with you to kind of bring out the true story and deepen the threads and really make it shine. Um, but on some level, because I wanted an editorial agent, it was important for me to know if my agent got my book. So on a call with an agent, I looked for things like, um, I specifically asked questions, I should say, around um, you know, why they liked the book, um, what parts stood out to them and why. And I mean, these conversations are not new to us as black writers. We talk about this all the time in DMs with our family. Like we, we understand how we can be, you know, um, treated like property. And I mean that in like a like are 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 we being collected or are we being appreciated? Are our stories being represented because um, that person inherently understands the importance of, of that story, why it should be on a shelf, or is it because they see it as a paycheck because of what's happening in the world? Like 
we talk about these things. Yeah. So don't be afraid to ask those questions. Maybe not, you know, in Am a, I in a an to you, but you would know how to read between yeah. the lines if you're talking to an agent. So yeah. you know when they're blowing smoke up your butt or when they're like truly the authenticity comes through. Mm-hmm. One thing I will say is when you're evaluating agents, it's not always about who has the biggest, fanciest sales and publishers marketplace. For one, I didn't know this until I was querying. Um, those sales don't just like populate on their own. Agents or someone with them has to have to put them on publishers marketplace. So there are many things that are just not on PM yet. Um, it's not it's not the most accurate list. It is a good indication, I think, in most cases, mm-hmm. um, but it's not, you know, every it's not comprehensive. So um, don't allow don't allow the the, the glitz of, of someone who has a big name or represents your favorite author. Um, it shouldn't dissuade you from querying them, but it shouldn't convince you to sign with them either. Mm-hmm. Um, really do the due diligence to research their communication styles, um, research ask them why they want to represent your story ask them who they intend to send it to and why the why question is so important because i think we we just know when someone is just when it's fluff and when it's authentic it just comes through i don't know how to put it any better than that without being you know too specific yeah. but you can definitely tell when someone read your story and understood why it needs to be on a shelf versus yeah they sort of understand in some sort of like drawn back way like oh this has diversity so this will probably sell that's not the advocate that you want they may be they may have the best intentions but that is not going to be my preference for you because it's they're they're on the learning journey sounds like and so i would i would suggest you get with someone that's a little further along on the learning journey so that we know they're representing you for the right reasons um and that does matter when it comes to putting together a sub list, when it comes to how they're deciding who to sub to. Um, mm-hmm. I always ask my agent to go out to black editors, make sure black editors are on the list, which is funny because Natalie always does that anyway, but um, it's something to ask for. Don't shy away from asking your agent, who are you going out to and asking them why that person. Go look at books who have been, you know, who editors who've done different books and, and don't be afraid to advocate for yourself. Um, speak up. like. I've met a lot of writers that are still so, they're so grateful to finally have an agent and I and I get you, okay, I get you, that they just don't speak up for themselves because they're afraid of being dropped or they're afraid of severing that relationship or their agent feeling questioned or something like that. And think of it like a relationship. If you were in a relationship with someone and didn't feel like you could ask questions, would that be a really great relationship? <laughs> Um, so I would say no, at least not for me. So don't just don't feel bad for standing up for yourself. Ask questions. Um, no one is going to be a better advocate for yourself than, than you. So that's my biggest advice. Advocate for yourself. Ask the questions um, and connect with other right other black writers in the community. We are here and we're very we're very close knit. So don't hesitate to reach out. Well, and speaking of, you've, you've mentioned that and you hinted that you have a mentor. Uh, what tips do you have for Black writers for seeking out mentorship, but also for those who want to be mentors, who want to give back and reach down and pull up? So I think um, get, having a mentor is really, really helpful. I mean, certainly black, um, any writer, um, but I would encourage Black writers to enter contests like Author Mentor Match and pitch wars. Those are great opportunities to get your work in front of someone to potentially help you um, revise it and put it, you know, take it, take the manuscript to the next level. That can be super helpful because frankly, um, it's just sometimes too hard to see the ways that our manuscript um, could use work because we're really attached to it. So we're a little biased and having that outside opinion can be very helpful. And just someone that has navigated the industry that knows, you know, that knows how to do revisions, who has revised with an editor or with an agent can be really, really helpful and just really help you level up your craft. And a lot of times those mentorships will lead to um, getting an agent, getting a book deal. Um, But again, the point of those, in my opinion, the greatest benefit of those mentorships is leveling up your writing and really 
improving on your skill. Um, getting a mentor outside of those programs, honestly, I mean, everyone has to decide what they have time for. And frankly, you know, everybody's availability and schedule is going to be different, but we are a very close knit community. So my, my suggestion is to connect with other black writers specifically on Twitter um, is a great place. Um, you can do local writing chapters. I'm not sure sure if some of them are doing like virtual events right now because of everything happening in the world, but getting connected locally or at the very least getting, connect on t getting connected on Twitter. And in those connections, you will find all the time people asking to swap pages here or there. Read my first chapter. What do you think about this? And that's how I met all of my critique partners. Literally, it was just, hey, can you read this chapter? Sure. Can you read this one? And the next thing you know, we're swapping whole manuscripts and giving each other feedback. Um, that's literally where I found and met everyone that I know in the writing community. So um, getting engaged in the writing community, um, taking that first step if you have to, to connect with other writers, not being afraid to DM someone or to comment on their post and just asking them a question. You can also engage in Twitter chats if you're not comfortable DMing someone. And those Twitter chats can sometimes be a segue into more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, one of the Twitter chats that I host is called hashtag Monday Mixer. And it's just an opportunity literally to network with other writers. And there are black writers, there was all sorts of writers there. But um, I, I would definitely encourage black writers to connect with other black writers. Uh, like I said, our community is very, very close. And finding a mentor, I mean, I mentor formally with those programs I mentioned, but then I also have a lot of writers who sometimes I just um, will read their first 50 pages or I'll read their manuscripts and give them notes. And so it's more of an informal mentorship. Um, and so, you know, I mean, sometimes you'll find that sometimes you won't, but don't, uh, don't discount a critique, a good critique partner, because in some ways your critique, your critique partner is going to have a view of your manuscript that's different from yours. And so they can sort of mentor your manuscript as well. Um, the longer you uh, network, I've, I've found the longer you network and the more you're engaged in the community, the more writers you meet. And so that's how I met my mentor. I participated in Div Pit and I ended up meeting my mentor that way. And it just, and I say mentor, um, it really just evolved into like me asking questions and her answering questions and then us just sort of getting along mm -hmm. um, and that kind of growing into um, what feels like an informal mentorship. So I wish I had a more direct, a direct suggestion, but really the biggest thing is networking and communicating. And I realize that that's a little uncomfortable. You know, not everybody is comfortable getting on a social media platform and just like introducing yourself like, hi, talk to me, read my book. But really, I mean, there's a lot to be said um, for taking that first step. And I guarantee you there are other writers that feel the same way that are looking for community. Um, if you are currently an author or writer and you're looking for a way to give back, I think a great place to do that is on Twitter. Um, I keep going back to Twitter, but like, I feel like so much of the publishing industry, at least in my circle, is on Twitter. There's so much in the industry on Twitter. So for like research purposes alone, you know, being on Twitter, even if you're just kind of lurking to observe and keep an eye on things is smart because there's a lot happening there, especially in the, the kid lit space. Um, so I would suggest, again, only do what you have time for. <laughs> and if you are a Black writer, a Black author, protect your peace. Self-care is paramount. The world is a lot right now. The world is always a lot, but the world is especially a lot right now. So do not feel like you owe anyone anything because you don't. Um, if you have some extra energy that you want to expend, and and give to another writer um a great way to do that honestly is the same things that i mentioned to people interested in mentors is those those uh writing chats monday mixture is a great place to meet people and honestly just you would be surprised if you, you could just tell a friend or two like a another a fellow author friend like i'm looking to informally mentor you know a writer if you know someone you'd be surprised how many how many things might ping up because there's always someone looking for eyes on their first 10 pages eyes on the query um 50 pages is kind of a big ask a full manuscript is also a big ask if you want to do something like that i would suggest applying to be a pitch wars mentor or being an author mentor match mentor the contests are both fantastic for different reasons the, the experience of doing them i've done amm twice um and i've done pitch wars once and 
they're very different, but they're very similar. <laughs> so there's a lot. Uh, I would do your research and you know figure out which one works best for your schedule. But I think both of mm -hmm. those create really cool opportunities to find a manuscript that you want to help because you, you like you have a whole basket of them, right? And you get to pull out something that really speaks to you. And uh, when you're mentoring a manuscript that you are also in love with, it it just takes on a whole new. It becomes like a passion project for you. You know, it doesn't feel like like work as much as it does excitement. And and then you have that writer leveling up and growing and revising. And then you get to like watch them, you know, frolic into the quarry trenches <laughs> and conquer the world. And so it's very rewarding if, if you have the time and energy <laughs> for it. So I suggest it. So apart from kind of the specific industry stuff and protecting yourself, I did want to ask you about the stories themselves and kind of how you personally have navigated the stories that you want to tell and the vulnerability of putting those out into the publishing industry and and some of your personal experiences as, as well as your advice for, for other Black writers. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, particularly because in publishing, we see a lot of um, attention paid to Black pain narratives. And um, I've actually had um, a writer I was mentoring at one point had gotten rejections on a manuscript because the story was too quiet. It was a Black love story. And they didn't want that. <laughs> so um, I don't know if they didn't want it or if they didn't think it would sell. But I mean, neither of those are better. So, you know, when I, when I decided to write Wings of Ebony, the voice of the character, Rue is my main character. Um, it was calling to me. She was calling to me and I, I didn't really have much of a choice. Like I needed to give space in my head and heart to my main character's pain and her anger. And in that moment, I didn't care what publishing thought about it. I didn't care if they thought it was a valuable na narrative, a good one, a bad one, interesting. I just knew that Rue had something to say and it deserved space and time. So I sat down and I wrote. And the story that poured out of me, I realized needed to be told, um, needed space on a shelf. Um, and so I pursued publishing it. And, you know, I was very fortunate to get lots of interest. Um, but I gotta be honest, you know, when I wrote, when I saw the fervency for that topic, and I know, you know, that black pain or, you know, narratives get more there. And the reason I, I just to qualify what I'm saying, like there is uh, an element of racism to my book. So I, I deal with racism in a very unflinching way in Wings of Ebony. And um, it's just a very important, a very important story. And I appreciated that it was, it would have space on a shelf. Um, but I had like I, what I was going to say earlier was that I I have to be honest when I sat down to write the next book I wanted to write I did I didn't want to write um, anything that had to do with racism or anything like that I wanted to just write something fun and lighthearted and there was a part of me who wondered well shoot like they may not even want this and it's unfortunate that that's even a thought that I had um, but that's just the reality of the publishing industry too often, um, the quiet stories, the just black people living their lives stories don't get um, picked up as often, or if they get picked up, they don't get pushed. Um, and so I wrote it anyway, obviously, <laughs> and it went really well. Um, editors did love it. It sold at auction. And I'm very excited to have that just fun, whimsical black joy story, magical story coming to shelves. Um, but, you know, it was a painful reminder when I was deciding that that would be my next project to work on that. In a way, publishing has put us in a box as Black writers for so long. And um, that's a very layered topic that I could go into multiple directions with. But I'll just say to Black writers that are writing, you write the story that you want to tell because you want to tell it. Regardless of if you think publishing is going to care or not care. Um, because at the end of the day, the story does need to be told. And 
we as black writers cannot validate or allow what what publishing thinks of our work to validate our experience. We mm -hmm. write about our experience because it is true, um, because we want to, and that just has to be enough. Um, I think what we're seeing right now um, on Twitter, if you are on, on Twitter or getting um, any sort of publishing news in your inbox, um, there's a lot happening right now, a lot of veils being pulled back and there's a lot in the industry that is very antagonistic toward um, black writers um, and very exploitive um, and, and even targeted at times. And so what I'll say to you is that that is even more reason for you to write your story um, with passion and with fire, whatever your story is. If it's vampires and they're saying, we're not buying vampires, I don't care, write your vampire story. If they're saying you're, you know, a black love story isn't um, racy enough or it isn't um, interesting enough, it's too quiet, write your love story. Um, my, rec my biggest recommendation is to stop allowing what they desire to hear from us to mm -hmm. shape the story that we tell. And I realize that that's a very like bold thing to choose. Like, I'm just gonna write what I wanna write and publishing is gonna take it or leave it. And I understand we're putting in so much time and effort and labor. And so there's a part of us that wants to appeal to what we know they're interested in. But I my I, I admonish you not to to cave to that and sort of cling to this hope that we are going to um, redefine this idea that publishing gets to decide what stories that mm -hmm. we get to tell and which stories are valid and which stories are worth, you know, acquiring and supporting with marketing, et cetera, et cetera. We mm -hmm. are going to unapologetically tell the stories that we want to tell because our community needs them. The world needs them. Um, and I realize that's the, you know, that's not an easy decision to make, but I, I, I encourage you to do that so that hopefully at some point um, we continue to see changes in the industry is my hope. I'm trying to be optimistic about this whole thing. Mm. Um, and I do love some of the things I'm seeing right now, mm. the access, um, the more the interest in stories from black writers. So I, 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 am, I am cautiously optimistic that, um, you know, that things will, will change and continue to change and hopefully cha be changing in an authentic sort of ground breaking sort of way. Um, but in the meantime, we just have to stick to writing the stories we want to write. Um, yeah. Black joy, black love, black magic, like whatever it is, um, it doesn't have. And if, and if you want to write that story on racism, you write that too. You write whatever you want to write. White writers have, have existed and been able to write whatever they want to write for, you know, since the beginning of time. And so we're not, we're going to take off the, the, this idea that we have to write within the box of the lane they allow us. Mm. And we're going to write what we want to write. And I am cautiously optimistic <laughs> that that will, uh, that that will, that we are making more space on shelves. I mean, because our space right now is about this big. And you Every know, that's just unacceptable. Come out and people don't believe it till you show them the hard numbers. And and, and even just just the other day, I saw one a statistic that only forty six percent of the books about black characters that came out were by black writers. We only have eleven percent or so of shelves anyway. So when you take that eleven point, we'll just say eleven percent. It might be like eleven point five. But that eleven percent, and then you realize less than half of those were actually written by us. Um, we are really, truly given, you know, this this much space. This is how far they're opening the door for us. But again, I am cautiously optimistic with everything that's happening in the world and this unprecedented access that we have right now. That that is going to impact that that number. I think that there are some great conversations happening right now about allyship. There's a lot sort of of just truth being laid on the table, and I'm hoping that this sort of shakedown is is going to kind of um, refine some of the processes that we see and sort of illuminate where the true allies are so that black writers can find these these people in the industry to to advocate for for us authentically i i did want to ask you about it's it comes back to that emotional labor but so much of that emotional labor that gets put onto black authors is the centering of the feelings of the white people in the publishing industry uh, and I, I 
I know it's something that you have to deal with. And I wanted to ask if you had advice for black authors of how to manage the white fragility and the white feelings when you encounter them, when they're thrust upon you, essentially. And then that, and that that is an aspect of navigating publishing that you can't escape. It's an unfortunate reality um, that you can't escape it. The first thing I'd say is, at least for me, you know, it's very important that we're not taking that burden and putting it on ourselves. Understand, it's their problem, not ours. You don't have to apologize for someone else not getting it. It is not your job to educate them. It is not your job to do the work. There are books available. They can spend time just like they research their book to write it. They can spend time researching that if they're very interested. That's my number one, you know, piece of advice because it's a very exhausting time to be everyone's one black friend with all their questions. And, it, you know, so often it's well-meaning, like truly like friends just think some of them, they just, I don't know who to ask. And I get it. I get it. But like, I'm, I'm, I'm about here with, with, you know, emotionally, like I'm, I'm, I'm filled up to the top. I have no more left. And, and as a black person, I, I don't have to apologize for that because it's not my work. It's not my job. Um, it's a white person's job to educate themselves. Um, can we escape white fragility in this industry? Unfortunately, no. Um, there's also, you know, the white gaze and, and, and you know, it comes into play in, in, in multiple facets of this process, right? Because we are working in an industry where we're going to work with white people and um, their opinions of our work and those types of things are going to come into play. Um, protect your peace as much as possible understand it's not your job to educate anyone. Um, and it's, you know, it's gonna look different in different in different relationships and the agent writer relationship, we're trying to get an agent. Um, I just think it's important that you, you kind of, when it's a problem, say it's a problem. Don't eat the emotional burden because you feel like it's your job too. Um, the biggest thing that I see are, are, you know, friends, black writers who are, forcing themselves to endure this emotional strain because they are afraid to say, you know, I'm not comfortable when you ask me that, you know, I'm not comfortable when you say that, you know, I don't want to put that in my book. Hmm. I have friends who have been told by agents to lean into being black a little bit more. You have to, you have to understand that yes, an agent is giving you an opportunity, but they are not the only agent and having no agent is better than having the wrong agent or having a bad agent. And so it's very important, I think, especially now more than ever, that you find that voice to say, you know, I'm not comfortable with this. I'm not going to explain this. Um, I don't share that opinion or, you know, you, it's, it's fair. And I think for so often, we are expected as black people to assimilate and exist in spaces and not, um, not tell our white counterparts that their opinion comes across a certain way. Uh, the way they're doing things feels racist. We're, we are so accustomed to, unfortunately, swallowing those words. And I think the conversations have opened. The door is bust wide, o burst wide open right now. And so I, I encourage you to step into that, to that doorway and say, you know, this is not okay. I am not okay with this. I don't want to put that in my story. Um, to, to stand up for yourself and to find that voice. And if you are too afraid to tell your agent, first of all, if you want to tell your agent those things and you're afraid to, that's something to, to consider. Like you need to, to really think about what, what's going on there because they're, you know, it, it may not be the best situation. Um, in an editor writer relationship, I actually think it's a little easier mm -hmm. to navigate that space because for example, I have a I have a black editor for my YA book, um, and she's amazing. Um, but I've talked to many friends who, you know, many black um, authors who have worked with editors who didn't fully understand a facet of the manuscript. For example, be it um, some language used or just something they wanted them to fix, and it was one of those things where it was like they just don't get it because they're white and there's actually a space <laughs> between your, you and your editor where you can just kind of like set changes and say, you know what? 
I understand what you're saying, but that's not how this is going to go because you're just, it's not connecting for you. So I'm going to go ahead and stick with my version and that's okay. And it's actually a beautiful thing. It's a very useful thing to have in an editor writer relationship. Um, and so it would be beautiful to see some, some more of that transparency happen in the, in the writer agent relationship, actually, now that I think about it, but, um, don't do the work. It's not your job to do the work. And, you know, I think the time is, is done for uh, existing in spaces um, without taking up space, with, with like mm -hmm. swallowing our words, thinking the thoughts, you know, venting to our friends, but not feeling like we have the ability, because we have so much on the line, um, to say how we feel. Mm -hmm. And I think that that time is done. So I think um, as Black writers, we need to say, I'm tired. I can't do this today. I'll never forget when all of this was sort of ramping up and the protests were in the thick of it. I was completely drained emotionally, physically. I wasn't sleeping good. And this is not unique to me. Okay. You know, my, my community everywhere, like every black person I know, family and beyond was tired, is still tired. And I will never forget that week. Somebody emailed me for something work-wise, not an editor or agent, something completely different. And I just remember writing back, I don't have anything for you. I'm exhausted. I'll be in touch. And I don't, I don't know if it's because of the protests or looking at the news or what, but they got it. They mm -hmm. wrote back and said, whenever you're ready, like I'm here. And like, they ask nothing of me. Mm -hmm. And had that, would that have happened if I wouldn't have just said, you know what, I know that I need to do this for you, but as a black person, you're not getting anything from me right now because <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm done. I'm so beyond done. I have nothing left to give and it's okay. Like, I feel like I've, I'm so used to like forcing myself in that. I don't have anything left to give space, forcing myself to continue to give. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it goes back to the way that, that we're just so accustomed to white people being centered and we're on the outside and we're, you know, and I think that's shifting. Mm -hmm. um, and whether it shifts or not, I'm just saying to my, to my fellow black people, like we don't have to, we don't have to dance around them anymore. We don't have to, uh, we don't have to sing and dance to their music. We don't have to do any of that. You can say, I am tired. I need a break. I'm exhausted. It is not my job to explain this to you. Go read a book. Like, there is a space now to say that. I mean, frankly, if we would have said it before, you know, who knows how it would have been received. But at, at least now I'm seeing that I have black writer friends who are feeling okay using their voice to say those things that feel uncomfortable. Uh, writers and beyond, really, you know, to their bosses. Like, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm done for today. Mm -hmm. And you're allowed to feel that way. Like our mental health is important. We are important. So um, I'm hoping that advocacy for black writers continues to be vocal um, unapologetically. I'm hoping that continues. Um, and I'm hoping that the emotional labor that it, that falls on our shoulders being in this community um, lessens. I am, I am slightly less optimistic about that, but I'm, I'm still hoping. I'm still hoping. Thank you so much for, for being here with me and for opening up about all of these things. And I, I love, well, I love you generally, but I love how open and honest and frank you are. I, well, I don't want your DMs to get completely flooded, but genuinely I hope <laughs> black people are seeing this. Like I, I want them to know who you are. I want them to buy your books, but I, I hope they are heartened knowing that you were there as a resource follow follow jl on twitter i'm gonna put all that down below thank you for having me i'm i'm grateful that you um you have a huge platform you have a lot of writers that come here for advice so thank you for creating space to have that conversation because there are i mean i was a black writer watching your channel trying to figure out what a query letter was and so i'm you know i'm grateful that that you've opened up the conversation um and that you're using your platform i appreciate that and i just want to say like I I think I've said this to your face, but like I'm just in awe of you. Like you are one of my super mentors. Like you took on two mentees at the same time and you crushed it. 
And you were just so giving, like you give personal feedback to so many of the people who submit to you. And I've, I've read some of them and I just think you have such an incredible spirit and heart and publishing is lucky to have you. I'm lucky to have you as a friend and I just, I love you. <laughs> well, thank you. It is mutual. I appreciate it. And uh, you guys watching, make sure you apply to be an AMM mentor because it is super fun. Lots of socializing. So definitely meet critique partners there. <laughs> we have a very fun Slack channel. So. Yes. <laughs> so let us know down below in the comments if you have any questions for JL. She will go through and answer as many as she can. And give this video a thumbs up if you like it. I will do more you know, interviews talking to other authors with experiences outside of my own who have amazing advice for you guys. And if you're not already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that. I post new videos two to three times a week. And as always, guys, happy writing.